My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply becoming a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Today, my guest on the show is Professor Massimo Piliucci. Massimo is one of those rare people who have three PhDs, if I remember correctly, one in genetics, one in evolutionary biology, and one in philosophy. And he is also the author of hundreds of technical papers in both science and philosophy, as well as a number of books on Stoic philosophy, including the best-selling How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life, and most recently, The Quest for Character, What the Story of Socrates, Alcibiades, what the story of Socrates and Alcibiades teaches us about our search for good leaders. I just finished this book. Fantastic read. Highly recommend it to everyone. Just fantastic read. I'll be actually rereading it probably. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Massimo. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So, guys, this is my second interview with Massimo. So, if you haven't seen the first one, I strongly suggest that you start there because we're not going to repeat any of the topics we covered last time. But instead, we're going to jump right in. However, this time around, we're going to start in a very particular way because Massimo has done a ton of interviews about this fantastic book. So, I highly recommend again the book and his interviews. But we're going to jump in a kind of a strange, perhaps, angle. So let me start with this question, Massimo. What is mass maiorum? <laughs> mass maiorum is the Latin phrase uh, that usually translates as the way of the ancestors or the customs or something like that. But it basically refers to the way things are normally done. In, uh, if, if society works in a normal function, this is the way we do things. And the Mos Maiorum is a big deal because the idea is that when the Mos Maiorum starts breaking down, that is when people, especially leaders and politicians, uh, start behaving by different rules by, or by ignoring the rules, then that's the beginning of the end. You know, we have heard, for instance, recently over the last few years, that um, uh, there has been somewhat of a threat to American institutions. And often the comment you hear is, but the institutions are resilient. Well, ask Cicero about that and see what he thinks, because he's, uh, he lived near the end of the Roman Republic, where the institutions were in fact collapsing. And he realized that, yes, the institutions are important, but by themselves, they are simply not going to do it. If people start ignoring basic rules of conduct, if people start acting in a way that violates the rules, uh, the institution themselves are not going to be sufficient to hold up a, 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 a functioning society. And uh, so, so the, the idea basically is that you need two things in order to run a country well. Yes, you, you need good institutions, obviously, a good constitution, a you know, good way, good laws, but you also need good people, or at least people that are conscious of the fact that they need to work within the system. If they start cutting corners and bypassing the normal functioning of the, of the, of the system, then the system itself is going to collapse. And the question then is, do you think that we are living at a time when our contemporary mass maiorum, so to speak, is falling apart? And I don't mean just locally, let's say in the United States or in most countries in the European Union, but at a global level, at maybe even the civilization level. That's a good question. And it's next to impossible really to to answer because uh the situations are different uh, locally and of course the global situation is the result of the emergence of a bunch of local situations so if we're talking about the united states for instance i would have told you just a few days ago before the the, the latest election the midterm elections that we just went through i would have told you that there was a significant risk of the system collapsing because uh, people started to ignore the most mayorum at the moment, given that the American electorate has rejected all of pretty much all of the candidates, 
that uh, started to behave on their own way w- without, without, you know, by ignoring the rules, then I'm barely. slightly, yeah, the, yes, barely, but they did and consistently. And so I'm now slightly more optimistic, or I perhaps should say slightly less pessimistic about what's going to go on in, in two years. But there's going to be another test. In two years, we're going to have the presidential elections and we'll have another test. At a level of, and so the situation is different in the United States, of course, as uh, in as compared to other countries. At at an international level, you know, we really never have had a international set of rules as such. We have suggested rules, right? We have the United Nations, uh, we have a body of so-called international law, but unfortunately, we do not have a way to enforce that law. And so, it has always been up to the individual countries whether to follow it or not, and. Uh, individual countries sometimes have followed and sometimes haven't, depending on, uh, again, the local situation, depending on what was convenient for them politically and and so on and so forth. And this includes not just obvious culprits like, you know, China and Russia, but the United States as well. So it is a little bit harder to say what's going on at at the global level because countries have pretty much always, or at least in recent memory, uh, behaved in a more or less rogue way. They, they always do their own thing first, and then they think about the rest of the world if they do it at all. So it's going to be interesting to see what develops over the next few years or decade or two, I mean, particularly because we're facing incredible challenging, beginning with the obvious one, which is climate change. I mean, if we don't come together and do things uh, in concert, that then this is going to be a catastrophe. And, and at that point, institutions and rules and, and, and customs are not going to matter because we're going to face something uh, fairly dramatic. But here's the thing that I'm, and the reason why I'm, I'm kind of pushing that line of investigation is, so walk with me a little bit and see how far we get and what your book has to say about that line of reasoning. So in my view, mass maiorum is a story. It's a story that tells us who we are where we're coming from and where we're going. It's a story that tells us what's right and what's wrong. It's a story that informs us how to live our lives. It's a story that pretty much is the foundation for almost everything that we do. And it's a story that tells us, that gives prescriptions as per how we can solve our problems and what are the desirable solutions. So all stories are like people. They're born, they live, and they die. So we had the story of, uh, you know, um, let's say uh, uh, pantheism, then uh, which kind of informed our lives. Uh, then we, we had the story of monotheism, which, which took over with all of its sort of consequences uh, about our place in the universe, about who we are, about where we're coming from and about where we're going, about what's the good life. Because each one of those stories, whether pantheism, whether monotheism, whether humanism, whether capitalism, uh, whether communism, contains all those foundational principles of a story that I that I mentioned. Who we are, where we're coming from, where we're going, what's right, what's wrong, what's the good life, and how are we to live it, and how are we to solve problems. And so we find ourselves today, I would suggest, in a place where the story that has brought us thus far is literally falling apart. And that's why we are looking at the problem such as, for example, climate change, and we have all the scientific evidence that we ever need to take action, but we're not because there is no one story that unites a sufficiently chunk enough of people, enough of us, to come together to a unified solution, to to a unified desirable outcome that a story that that tells us who we are going to be and who we want to be and what is to be done and how to um, solve our problems. And so, uh, for example, take, for example, the story of monarchy. Uh, you know, for many thousands of years, we had the story that the king has the, is the, the representative of God and he has the divine right to being a king. 
Um, and that was the story of how we organized ourselves as a nation and even as a civilization. Um, and it told us what's right, what's wrong. Uh, we had the conception of justice stemming from there almost. Uh, we had the conception of uh, everything stemming from that story. Then eventually we replaced that story with the story of democracy, right? And each of those stories gives us solutions or prescriptions to our most recent problems. The moment we have a story that's carried us thus far but is no longer able to provide solutions to our current problems, the story falls apart and we have an intellectual revolution. That's what happened during the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, right? We had sort of the Dark Ages, uh, during which time religion was the major story of organizing our civilization. And monotheistic religion, especially in the West, it was Christianity as the organizing principle of our civilization. We got to the point where, due to a number of stress factors like the Industrial Revolution and so on, that old story was no longer able to provide uh, uh, satisfactory solutions as per how we are to live our life uh, in the future, consequently. And so we had sort of the Enlightenment, we had uh, the Renaissance, we had all those ideas who were proposing a new organizing principle. We had humanism, right? We have all those new ideas which are proposing a new organizing principle on the, on the which roof humanity can come together to live peacefully and to coexist peacefully. And now it seems that uh, that story to me, it seems is kind of walked its way. It's taken us pretty far, but it's no longer sufficient to address our problems in the beginning of the 21st century. And people are looking for new stories or going back to the old stories whether fascism in Italy, whether, you know, uh, let's make America great again, or whether Boris, Boris Johnson's populism. People are hungry, but there is no one story that has taken over. That's why you have this kind of huge spectrum of diversity of mutually incompatible stories, which actually deepen our differences rather than uh, help us resolve them. And that's why, despite the fact that we have all the science to solve climate change and to take sufficient action. We're not, because our stories are so incompatible with each other that the same science doesn't allow us to take the same action. So anyway, that was perhaps a, a badly organized um, introduction to see if I can take us into that kind of direction of investigation a little bit today, and then maybe look and see if your book tells us anything about that and where it could fit there. But let's start with the bigger picture. What do you think of my kind of reasoning so far? Well, it's an interesting way to put it. Uh, and certainly, the most maiorum, uh, certainly the way we look at the, at the world are stories that we tell ourselves. There's no question about it. I um, mean, you know, at least that's that's one good way to look at it. Where I would disagree is that we've ever, ever had a unifying story at any time in the history of humanity. Sometimes there were unifying stories in a large chunk of humanity, like you mentioned monotheism, for instance. Sure, in the Mediterranean area, monotheism had, has been the uh, dominant story since the from the collapse of the Roman Empire until pretty much the Renaissance. But in other places in the world, that wasn't the case. I mean, if you if you move even at the same time to China or India or Japan or, or South but America. But the golden ages in all of those, whether in China, whether in India, in the Hindus Valley, or whether in Western world, whether even in America, the golden ages are always accompanied by the absolute preponderance of a, preponderance of a single story. Even if you take Islam. Islam was a story that was born around 6th, 7th century, and then it took off like a wildfire, and it spread, and right. it almost conquered the world, and created the Ummah, which spanned from northern Africa all the way to Indonesia. Right, I agree. But what I'm saying is, there has never been a time where there was a single global story. So there was always competing stories, and that's what we have today. 
uh, we have competing stories. We we have you know the the story that some at least most countries in the West are still putting for, forth, which is the story of democracy, and then we have different kinds of stories coming out of the other major superpower at this point, which is China, not to mention a bunch of other fractured stories uh, scattered throughout the world. So I think that the problem isn't that a global story is is, is uh, you know falling down and it's falling to pieces is the problem is that as usual we have a competition of different stories and need, none of them becomes dominant not that i necessarily think it would be a good thing for one story to be dominant at the global level i'm not sure what that would look like but the fact is it has actually never happened even when you mentioned a few minutes ago you know populism in the in the uk and in italy italy is not a hasn't slid into fascism and probably will not. It's still another kind of populism, right? Right-wing right populism. But even if you're talking, and the same, of course, has been in the case in the United States before the current president, and to some extent uh, still is, even that has happened before, right? I mean, in, in fact, fascism has happened before. And, and so, so, and depending on how you look at what do you mean by fascism? If by fascism you need a sort of totalitarian uh, or, or aspiring to totalitarian system uh, that that uh, controls the public discourse in an almost complete way, then you can also put into the mix things like Bolshevism. It's not that that was that different from, from fascism. Uh, allegedly, they were on the right and on the left, but in fact, they amounted to about the same, about the same thing. So... So I don't know that the problem is the lack of a unified global story. That may be the case, but the fact is that I don't think we've ever had a situation like that in the history of humanity. Now, you say you're asking the right question, which is why are we not able to uh, to attack a problem like global warming that we know how to, uh, well, at least we know it's happening. We know the causes and we have a, some decent ideas about what we could do ab about it, right? Um, but that too has happened before, not at a global level, of course, but at a, at a local level. I mean, there is always been people who have seen further than others. There's always been people who have seen the consequences of a course of action and they try to warn others, I, like, you know, in, to write my book, uh, The Quest for Character, I, I, I reread uh, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, which was a defining moment in the history of the ancient world. And um, he and a few others knew exactly what was happening. They warned other people about the disastrous consequences of that kind of course of action, especially for Athens. But did they be, the people listen? Of course not. So... I think that part of the problem here is that we have the usual contrast that humanity has never been able to really handle properly or overcome between long-term benefit for many people and short-term benefit for a few people. The reason we are not doing anything for about climate change is mostly because a few people are getting themselves uber rich out of continuing the status quo. Because a few billionaires insist in making money the way they've been making money over the last few hundred years. And those billionaires have enough money and therefore enough power to basically buy most of our politicians and most of our media. And the result is that they can sell their message to uh, a large enough chunk of the population so that we don't do anything. So how do I overcome that? I have no idea. That's a damn good question. Um, but I don't think, I'm not particularly optimistic. I think that the history of humanity shows us that when we are about to face a catastrophe, which would be preventable, what we actually do is we go through the catastrophe and then we get together and, and, and recover. I mean, that's what happened to during the Peloponnesian War. That's what happened during famines. That's what happened during uh, all sorts of other environmental collapses, even more, more locally. I think it's going to be a catastrophe. Millions of people are going to die. And the survivors <laughs> are going to get together and say, oh, crap, uh, now we need to do something. Um, so that's, that's my prediction. We'll see, I guess. <laughs>
And, and you may well be right, but I think the reason for that is that after the catastrophe, you would have the story that would unite the survivors in taking action because they would have a single fundamental story to begin with. And I'm saying that if we can take the shortcut and come up with that story in advance, so yeah, you can say maybe uh, historically speaking, we've never had a one global story and that's my not my claim. My claim is that every time you had a, 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 a golden age of one kind or another, you had a, a local preponderance of a single dominant story that lasted for a very long time. And so as far as Rome is concerned, for example, that was the entire world. As far as China is concerned, for example, they are the kingdom in the se- in the heavens, in the center of the world. That's the Chinese story. To this day, by the way, super yeah. powerful and influential with the leaders in China. That's uh, the story of uh, you know, uh, democracy. So the 20th century, in a way, was a clash of three stories, fascism, communism, and capitalism. Fascism was allegedly the first one to die around World War II. Then communism collapsed uh, in around 89, let's say. And then, of course, uh, pseudo-intellectuals like Francis Fukuyama went on to proclaim the end of history because, in his opinion, uh Capitalism was not only the best story that we have ever told, but it's the best story that could ever be told. And therefore, there could be no more further improvement on that story. And therefore, it's the end of history, you see. But the events of the first couple of decades of our century have now demonstrated that that story, capitalism, is falling apart. So the problem is not that the Chinese are doing what the Chinese are doing or the Russians are doing what the Russians are doing. The problem is that us here in the West we have n- not been so disunited in a very long time. We are so polarized, much more so than ever before. Uh, and in the United States, perhaps since the Civil War, there hasn't been such a deep and profound fundamental division. And that's because there is no one uniting story. Now, that uniting story may be, uh, let's say for the United States, was maybe the Cold War, the, the fight of, you know, capitalist democracy versus uh, proletarian totalitarianism like the Soviet Union was. And maybe that was the story that united the Americans for a long time there. And now that the, the, that story collapsed and the, the institutions of the democracy are eroding, maybe things are st- starting to fall apart. So what I'm trying to suggest here, let me see if I can shift our conversation. What I'm trying to suggest here is the following. So it seems that your book, The Quest for Character, has a, a, a thesis which would say that, in a way, we are falling short of our story. In other words, your book, in a way, which is a fantastic book, suggests that if we are living a life of excellence, a life of virtue, as epitomized by a number of people, such as Socrates, such as Cato, and maybe a few others, Marcus Aurelius, that would allow us to live up to our story and to be the best version of ourselves individually and the best version of ourselves collectively. I propose a different idea. I propose that the story is also falling short of us, that we don't only need uh, that that we therefore we need a new story to remotivate us to rise up and to be better selves. That every time you have a popular revolution, you have the birth of a new story. Just like Christianity was the birth of a new story, just like uh, Islam was the birth of a new story, just like the industrial revolution and capitalism were births of a new story that triggered democratic movements, just like democracy is a new story. Because the older previous stories were no longer serving and able to to keep us together and help us to solve our problem. Yeah, but the problem with these stories, including the ones that you just mentioned, that they didn't just create a good time for a certain number of people. They also typically created a horrible time for other kinds of people. I mean, you know, the Enlightenment was directly responsible for the the the, the colonialism that came afterwards, you know, a uh, hundred plus years afterwards. So it's like, yeah, do we want that kind of story? Because yeah, it's good for us, 
you know, wh whoever buys into this story, it's not so good for the rest of the world. And of course, the same goes for the other stories that you're talking about. I mean, capitalism, which is, you're correct, the one that survived the, the tribulations of the 20th century. But, you know, capitalism itself killed or, or made miserable millions of people. So I'm not so sure that a unifying story is such a good idea uh, because unifying stories are, they inspire for sure. They, ins they do inspire people. That's their positive role. But the problem is that they're totalitarian in a sense that is, or totalizing in a sense. That is that that's the story. And unless you get behind that story, uh, then, then, uh, then there is trouble. Unless and that new story is decentralized and sort of, uh, horizontal rather than totalitarian and uh, single point single point of view. But the only decentralized and non-totalitarian story that I know of is in fact the story that I tell in the book, the story of virtue, because that comes from the bottom up. That is not that's not proposing a system or a unifying idea. Uh, behind which everybody needs to to get in order to thrive and 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 do and do well, uh, it's an individual story. It's the idea is that a, a good society comes out of the good effort of individual people, and not as a result of a a story that is essentially told top down. So I don't know of any examples of successful decentralized stories like the ones you're talking about, but, you know, I'm open to the possibility. Well, uh, the, the, the future story would be different, in my opinion, than the past stories. And that's why we have progress. That's how, for example, the, the virtuous story, the, the, the story of virtue that you're telling in your book happens also within the context of the story of slavery. And all of that virtue is built upon, in some ways, the sweat of whether in Athens, whether in Rome, on, on the backs of slaves. So, but so there is no perfect story. There hasn't been one. I agree with you. Each story has tremendous problems, but ideally, the stories get better in time, uh, hopefully, uh, and, and and create more space for, for for more virtue and more space for freedom and more space for inclusivity. That's to say decentralization and more space yeah. for choice. But I don't I, I disagree that the story of virtue is built on the back of slave of slaves. The um, material conditions of ancient Greece and Rome were built on the back of slaves. That's for sure. But that has nothing to do with virtue. In fact, virtue is kind of the the opposite of material conditions. You know, the, the, the virtuous approach says the material conditions are actually irrelevant. They're not they're not really that valuable. So I'm not sure that I that I um, agree with, with with that point, but the the thing is, when you say that we need a new that a new story, the story of the future will be different. Yes, uh, every story that we've been so far was different from the ones that we have had before. But you're not just asking for a different story; you're def you're asking for a different kind of story. Uh, when you said uh, you know that you want a decentralized one, and I don't see how that's going to happen. But again, I'm. I'm open to suggestions. I don't. I don't know how that will work. We don't have a precedent in history uh, for that kind of decentralized. I don't type see of story. it yet, but but I think there is a need for it. And you know, people didn't see Christianity, which took over the world. People didn't see Islam, which took over the world. People didn't see communism, which triggered popular revolutions all over the world. Uh, people didn't see all the major revolutionary changes, which each of them came together, packed up in a new story, right? A new story about how we got to where we are, where we're going, what's right and what's wrong, what's the good life, how can we achieve it, and all of that. Each of those stories, Islam, Christianity, uh, capitalism, communism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Stoicism, they all have their prescriptions about that. And there's commonalities, of course, and we're going to talk about those now. So, but let me say, my big, whole beginning here was successful or maybe not, was an attempt to steer you off the rails a little and put you in a new realm of contemplation that, because I've seen like dozens of interviews of yours in the last few days on your book, and they're all tremendous, but I didn't want to have just the same old interview. So 
your answer to my kind of dilemma. So let's say we have an agreement that we're facing this, the problem that we, I believe, both agree on, and your solution to that problem is virtue. So, Well, I would phrase it differently. It's not a solution to the problem. It is a solution to how to cope with the problem. I think the problem itself is insoluble. Right. The, the problem will come and it will, as I said, if by problem in this case we mean, for instance, something like climate change. The problem will come, it will kill millions of people. It is not soluble. We will not be able to solve it. I don't think so. If history is any, any guidance. Not because we are incapable in principle, but because we don't want to. We just don't have the political will to do it. So given that, then the only alternative, the, the only question that remains is, okay, and how are we going to cope with it? The, the, the people that has to go through, have to go through this thing, how do we, do we cope with it? And the answer is, how do we cope with everything else? Uh, with resilience and with, in a sense, virtue. Yes, that's, that's the idea. Okay, so let's define our terms. What is virtue then? Virtue is a, uh, there's one, more than one, of course, virtues, it's, it's plural. Um, it, they're, they're character dispositions. So imagine that you think of, you know, you have a friend who is generous or, uh, uh, or courageous or anything like that. What that means is that other things being equal, that friend will behave in ways that we will recognize as generous, courageous temperate, and so on and so forth. So it's so vir the virtues are a series of character traits, character dispositions, uh, that given certain conditions, you will act more or less, broadly speaking, in a certain way. And then the following question then is, how does one cultivate virtue? Yeah, that's a great question. The, This, there's been a debate, of course, for a long time about this, beginning with, with Socrates and, and the sophists. My view and the view that I put forth in the Is in, it even possible? Book, yeah, I think it is possible. I mean, the chap as you know, the, the book opens up with a chapter asking precisely that question, you know, is, is teaching virtue possible? And Socrates himself kind of changed his mind about this at some point. He says, no, it's not. I don't think so, because I don't see any teachers of virtue out there. So I don't think it's possible. If it were possible, you would, you would see teachers. Uh, but then changes his mind. He says, actually, I think that is possible. But it is possible in a particular fashion. So virtue cannot be taught in the way in which we, we teach, let's say, mathematics or physics. That is, it's not a theoretical thing. I cannot sit somebody down and say, okay, here's what virtue is, and here's, here's how you do it. And then you get up and do it. Why? Because virtue is more like a skill. It's what the Greeks call a techne, which is the root of the English word technique, of course. And so it's more similar to, let's say, something like playing a musical instrument or, uh, or, or playing a, a, some kind of sports or something like that, so, or, or painting. So how do you do that? Well, you need three components. You do need a little bit of theory. Because, you know, if you play musical instrument, let's say, and you know nothing about musical notation or nothing about harmonics or anything like that, then you're going to have a little bit of a trouble. It's going to be more useful if you do have a little bit of theory. However, you also need a good teacher who is going to look at your technique and make suggestions for where you're going wrong, how you can improve it, you know, that sort of stuff. But mostly, you need a lot of practice. Right? You know, if, you, if you ever, if any, anybody was picked up an instrument and will tell you that, yeah, sure, I can study it a little bit. Yeah, sure, I can have a teacher. But mostly it's about practicing the, those damn scales up and down and up and down every day, several times a day, so that then you get more and more proficient at it. So virtue is something similar. It helps, I think, to have a general theoretical understanding of what virtue is. For instance, I find the stoic approach based on four cardinal virtues Uh, particularly useful. Those are practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. I think those those give you a good moral compass. You you, you know you use it in order to understand what is in, what is it that you want to do, what kind of priorities you want to set up. So that's fine. Having teachers, of course, not everybody can afford the Socrates, and there are not many Socrates around. Uh, 
But, you know, you can certainly look at teachers of the past. You can look at things that people have done and written in the past. So you can read about Socrates or you can read about Marcus Aurelius. Presumably, there are also teachers alive today. So you could, you could uh, approach one of those people. But most importantly, you practice every day. Now, the problem is how, how do you practice virtue? Because it's pretty clear how you practice a musical instrument, right? You just pick up the musical instrument, you have simple exercises in front of you, and you start playing. Great. But what does it mean to practice virtue? Well, there are a number of ways. And uh, to some extent, really, it's, the limit is your imagination. But let's say, for instance, just to give you an example, that um, you want to be temperate. You, you realize that you know temperance is my is a little bit of a problem for me. I'm not I'm not temperate. I'm not self controlled. I don't I don't do that very well. Well, so how do you practice temperance? You start being mindful of the situation where you tend to be intemperate, and you plan ahead of time for those situations. For instance, if you know that whenever you go out for dinner with friends, you eat and drink too much, something like that, right? So, well, how do I do it? You can't just say to yourself, oh, tonight I'm not going to do it because that's not going to work. Uh, you, you sit down in dinner and the conversation gets going. And then by the end of the dinner, you, you, you add too much drink and too much food. You make a contract with yourself or even better yet with somebody else, with a friend. And you say, look, tonight I am going to only order a salad, let's say, and only drink one drink, one glass of wine. Or tonight I'm going to, whatever I'm going to order, I'm going to cut the thing in half and only eat half of it. But you say that explicitly to yourself, or as I said, even better to somebody else, so that they hold you accountable. You basically set up a buddy system. And we know, we have evidence from modern behavioral psychology that buddy systems do work. If, you're, if you hold yourself accountable, uh, you will actually uh, succeed in what you're trying to do. If you don't, if you just say to yourself, oh yeah, I'll do better, uh, it, it's not going to happen. So that's the idea. So I do think that virtue can be taught, can be learned for sure, but it does require internal effort. I mean, one of, you know, there are two chapters in the book where I go through a number of historical examples of either leaders and statesmen who were approached by philosophers who were trying to teach them virtue as contrasted with leaders uh, who themselves wanted to be virtue and therefore they sought out the help of philosophers or, you know, or guides. And the pattern is pretty clear. Uh, the first group usually fails. Think about Plato failing twice with the two tyrants of, of Syracuse, in Dionysus the first and Dionysus the second. Think of Seneca failing with uh, Nero and so on and so forth. The second group usually is a success. Think of Marcus Aurelius. Think of Cato the Younger and so on and so forth. Think of Cicero. So I think that's the major difference. That is, you cannot, virtue isn't the kind of thing that somebody can come in from the outside and say, here's what you need to do. With one exception, and that is an important one that um, I only go to some extent into in, in the book, but I think that uh, we need to have a broader conversation about that. And that is, the exception is you can, in fact, instill virtue in other people if you get them young enough. If you're looking at children, not at adults. The problem with people like you know Dionysus and, and, and even Nero, even though Nero was a teenager when Seneca got to him, is that it's too late. By that time, we have already formed pretty much our character, and it's not going to change much unless we actually want to make an effort in order, in order to change it. So the thing is, we should be concerned with children. We should be concerned with the next generation. And let me give you one example uh, that I saw recently. There is a documentary uh, that is making the rounds these days called Young Plato. Yeah, it's Which a is fantastic about, movie. It is. And it's about an elementary school in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. And it's, the story is about the principal of that school who teaches practical philosophy to his students. And it's amazing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly effective uh, documentary. It, it shows the, the practical effect that philosophy has on children who have to deal with issues ranging from bullying to, of course, the culture of violence uh, in which they grew up, they're growing up and being, being Northern Ireland. But we don't do that. I mean, it's, it's so unusual that when this happens, you have, people actually do a documentary about it, right? 
Uh, most of the times we don't do that. And I think that's a major problem that we need to uh, figure out how to address. We need to teach our kids virtue when they are that little, when they are in elementary school, because that is when our character is malleable. That's where our ideas are formed. If you wait too late, then then you have to rely on people actually wanting to do it. You're not, you're not going to be able to direct them yourself. You know, it seems to me you're a lot more skeptical and I'm a little more optimistic than you because despite the fact that you your whole book, in a way, is a tool of teaching virtue uh, and it's a great tool and it goes through all the pitfalls and all the benefits and all the reasoning and so on. And yet at the same time, you say that you're skeptical. We're not going to do it. We're not, therefore, we're not going to solve climate change. It's not going to percolate into politics. Uh, doubts are kind of a lost cause. Whereas I, I would say, actually, if we manage to percolate the story of virtue, it will help us solve climate change. It would help us prevent wars like the one in Ukraine right now. Uh, and in response to you, yes, children are a lot more malleable. That's a fact. But look at the followers of Gandhi. Look at the followers of Martin Luther King Jr. Many of them were people in their 30s and 40s and even in 50s. And there's many examples, especially around Gandhi, but even Martin Luther King Jr., who simply due to the power of their own choice, uh, not choice, example, personal example, living their story, living their example, they managed to change and influence even the character of those around them at a very young age to the point where people were totally changed. And if you look at it historically, that's what religions also do. That's supposedly what Muhammad did with his followers what uh, uh, Jesus did with his followers. That's what revolutionaries tend to do with their follow followers uh, of one kind or another in one place or another, whether for good or for bad. Uh, and so that seems to me is, is a bit of a difference to us, uh, between us in terms of like how far we can go. What would you want to say about that? Well, first of all, I love to be shown to be wrong. Um, you know, it's not like I like to be a pessimist about the human condition. It's just to me, that's just realism to, the, to me is, is like if you look at the history of humanity, that's what you get. Um, and but I love to be shown to be wrong. So it's not don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like I actually relish the notion that we're going to be uh, keeping going through you know, muddled, muddled through. But the fact is, we have muddled through throughout our entire history. And that doesn't mean there isn't, hasn't been any progress. I mean, absolutely. The abolition of slavery, for instance, was one of the great moments in, in humanity, although we still have slavery in some places in the world. But nevertheless, uh, that was certainly so. People, When people tell me, for instance, oh, there has never been examples of moral progress, that's baloney. Of course, there has been, uh, and which shows that things can happen. And, and, and the two examples you mentioned, the certainly cases of improvement, you know, the Indian independent movement and the civil rights movement in the United States. That said, there is a lot of caveats. It's far more likely, for instance, that India, that Gandhi succeeded not because of his ideas or because of his movement, but simply because after World War II, Britain was in no condition to hold an empire. Um, there, there's pretty good evidence that that was the case. And, you know, the British were finished from a financial perspective and from a military perspective. So they were very happy to concede, not only in India, but in a number of other places. They in were the world. not happy. They imprisoned him. They killed people on a large scale, sure. peaceful people. They but it was inevitable. Happy. But people, but pe but it was inevitable. It's not, it wasn't going to, sure. it was not going to, and it, as I said, it was inevitable in, in large part because of the military and financial situation of the empire, not not necessarily because... And he didn't do it with military terms. He did it in a peaceful manner. He basically said from the beginning, and that's when people laughed at him, that he would make the British pick up and leave with peaceful right. resistance. And people laughed at him. And so if Britain was a military or not a military power, it didn't make a difference because his goal was not to defeat them on the battlefield, which is why he refused to fight them on the battlefield, yes. but he chose to fight them morally. Yes. With his... But what I'm suggesting, I guess, yeah. is that he didn't, that the, the thing succeeded not as much because of Gandhi, but because of the 
circumstance, historical circumstances immediately after World War II. It's not a, it's not a coincidence that India obtained uh, independence in 1947, exactly sure. immediately after the end of World War, the, the Second World War. Now, as far as Martin Luther King is concerned, yeah, again, another good example of how you can rally people around one idea about a story, as you were putting it, and you can certainly make progress. Absolutely. But the fact is, uh, we're still nowhere near uh, where Martin Luther King Jr. wanted wanted us to be, right? We are now about more than half a century later, and we still have systemic racism in the United States. We still have horrible conditions for a lot of black people in the United States. So, as I said, we muddled through. I'm, and I'm not suggesting that we don't make any progress. <laughs> I am simply saying that, unfortunately, that progress is is far more complicated, patchy, and um, and also reversible. I mean, look at what sure. just happened in the United States, for yeah. instance, with women rights. Right? You know, uh, for yeah. fifty years we were just fine, and then all of a sudden we we slid back all the way to the nineteen seventies, you know, early seventies. So this kind of stuff, unfortunately, can happen. Uh, you know, sliding back is 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 a is a very uh, real possibility. Uh, that includes at a political level, right? Uh, countries can slide back into fascism or to slide back into uh, Bolshevism and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll see. I, as I said, I, I don't, I don't, this is certainly not an issue of denying progress nor of the fact that big ideas are important. People respond to big ideas. In fact, people respond to stories, period, big or small. Yeah, right? because the ideas motivate us. They give us the why Correct. of virtue. Correct. Right? The story gives us the why we should be virtuous and de- motivates us, gives us that initial impetus to rise up to that virtue that the story demands of us. Right. But the problem we are now faced with, that's of, that of climate change, is unprecedented. So far, we have had problems that were essentially local, local, sometimes local at a large scale, but local. No, nothing has ever threatened the life on the planet Earth. That's uh, why know. we need a story that's also global. Right. And a unifying story, because previously, that's actually part of the, the point I'm making here. Previously, our problems were local. So we had local stories with limited span and duration. And you p- rightly pointed out that there was not one single global unifying story. But now, today, our problems are not so much local. The big problems we have, whether nuclear weapons, whether artificial intelligence, whether global warming, whether right. pandemics, all of the major problems we'll have, we have are no longer local but global. Therefore, local stories, local solutions aren't going to work. We need a global solution. And to have a global solution, you need a global story, which creates the framework within which such a solution is worked out and and, and it even motivates people to get there. And lacking that, you're lacking the framework within which it's like, look at the World Cup. We're right now in the middle of the World Cup in Qatar. You have all kinds of countries that disagree with each other on pretty much everything, including with the host and their idea about governance, democracy, gay rights, you name it. But we agree about the overarching story of soccer and the rules and the referees. And whenever there is a clash between Germany and Japan or two other countries that disagree with each other, you have a mechanism embedded in the story about the conflict resolution and it's directed into a peaceful resolution through the framework of that story which we all embrace and that's how you have the world cup which is a story of soccer that creates all the rules about what is right what is wrong how is the game to be played what is the winner what is the loser and how when we have the clash of uh, conflict uh, problems are to be resolved with an independent referee, for example, right? Sure. Uh, again, we'll see. Uh, I don't. I don't see any such global story emerging in the moment. Uh, you know, I, we could. We might be surprised. The thing is, I'm arrogant better, enough better happen, to work on it. <clears throat> better happen soon. <laughs> Well, good luck to you. Uh, it, it better happen soon because you know global global change, global warming is already happening, and and it's in, it's accelerating. Uh, 
the threat of nuclear weapons has been around now for more than half a century. So, you know, if we don't come up with something convincing pretty soon, uh, then uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see a way out. But we'll see. As I, I said, understand. I'm, I'm open. Let me. Do you know who Robert McGee is, by the way? No, I don't think so. Yeah. So Robert McGee is this kind of a older guy. He's probably in his late seventies, early eighties. He's been teaching a course on writing for the last 40 years, maybe 50 years, if not, maybe since 70s or 80s. His students have won like 80 uh, Oscars, maybe hundreds of Emmys, all kinds of awards. And here's what he had to say about writing. And I was, when I was reading this, I was thinking about virtue. And you tell me what you think about this quote. That's Robert McKee. And I took that from a conversation, from an interview with him. He said, because people were te- asking him, can you t- teach people writing and how do you do it? And here's what he says. You cannot teach a writer how to write. You cannot teach anybody how to do anything. The how they have to do themselves. All you can teach is what it is. And the clearer their understanding of what it is and the more they understand what is fundamental and what is ancillary, so that they don't confuse one for the other. And the more they have a sense of balance and proportion, the more they can do it. So I wonder if we can learn anything about virtue from this quote, because it reminds me strongly to kind of Socrates. I mean, in some ways, doesn't it? Maybe so, but I disagree with the quote. I I think it's just faults uh, that we cannot teach anything to anybody, including writing. I mean, there's lots of programs around the country where they teach you writing. Of that's course, what you can he teach does. Writing. Right. It's, that's which means that is the quote is actually self-defeating. If he cannot teach, if he thinks that he cannot teach writing, then what the hell is he doing? I mean, this is one of those things that sounds good at, on, on surface. And then you think about it for a second and you say, wait a minute, what? No, of course we can teach writing. Of course we can teach all sorts of things. But as we were saying before, people have to have the motivation to actually learn. You, what you cannot do is to force people to learn. You can put the, the tools at their disposals. You can provide you know, meaningful and, and actionable advice uh, to them. But unless they want to do it, there's just no way that they're going to be doing it. And that is the, the case not only, of course, for writing, but particularly for virtue. In the case of virtue, yes, there is all sorts of things that we can teach, both theoretically and practically. But un- unless the person wants to be uh, learning that kind of stuff, then there is nothing I can do about it, right? I mean, it's the same thing that I that I tell my students when the, when I get upset about them not doing what they're supposed to be doing. I tell them, you know, I can teach you something, but I cannot learn it for you. Learning is up to you. It's not up to me. All I can do is to provide you the, the instruments, but whether to take advantage of, uh, of those instruments or not, that's up to the individual. And I think that's been the problem with virtue in particular, but a bunch of other things uh, in, in more, more generally. That is, a lot of people are just not motivated, sufficiently motivated to, to learn things, to exercise themselves. I found that quote to be very paradoxical because his students are the most successful lot of writers you can imagine. Pulitzer yeah. Prize winners, Booker winners, 80 Oscars, as I said, 80 Oscars. So clearly he would, if anyone were to say, I can teach it, would be him. And yet he says, you can't. And he says the how they have to figure out themselves. And that reminded me to a point where Socrates, I think maybe it was in the Apology, where he says, I've never taught anyone anything except for this one time, but that was about love. (laughs) But, but, But he really was never taught anyone anything. Uh, and I, I found that to be to be kind of very interesting. And I kind of expected you to disagree, which is why I wanted to share it with you. Not only that, but I disagree with Socrates. I think Socrates has been disingenuous uh, when he says that he hasn't taught anything to anybody. If you actually read the Socratic dialogues, both by Plato and by Xenophon, it's pretty clear that he's teaching stuff. Not only that, but he's pretty clear that he knows what he wants to teach. He's not asking questions at random. Yes, it's true that he teaches indirectly. That is, he doesn't give answers to people. He gets the answers out of, out of questioning people. But that questioning is clearly uh, 
aimed at certain directions. I mean, if you read, for instance, one of the uh, classic and arguably one of the best Platonic dialogues, the Eutyphro, where Socrates and Eutyphro talk about piety and, and morality, what is pious and what is moral, and where, where we get these, these ideas. It's very clear to me that Socrates knows exactly where he's going when he's questioning Eutyphro. He pretends that he does not. Uh, but that's a gimmick. That's, that's, a, um, that's a way to lure his interlocutor in by letting him think, letting him think that, you know, I don't have an agenda. I am not trying to, you know, I'm not good. I'm not, I don't know anything. So let's see what you, what you do. But the result is you get your interlocutor in. And then once he's in, he's, he's trapped into what it very much looks to me like an agenda and like a, a particular aim that Socrates has in mind. Yeah, but I like the point where he says that all you can teach is what it is. And I think that's what Socrates was teaching. That's why I like that quote. Because I think that with his living example, not with his theory or not with his, quote, lessons, Socrates taught the four cardinal virtues by showing the people around him what those are, but not telling them how to get there. You see where I'm going with this? That's why I like it. So he knew what they were and he lived them in a way. And that's how he taught them. But he didn't tell people how to get there. They had to figure out that on their own, just like the writing quote that Robert McGee said. All he could do is show them what those are. Again, I disagree. Yeah. Uh, if you go into, into Xenophon, very much Socrates tells people how to get there. Yeah. But yes, he also exemplifies what he's talking about. He's not just talking, he's also practicing, right? He's not he's also embodying I mean what makes Socrates I think great uh is precisely the fact that he's living his philosophy. He's not just talking to people about it. He's not just telling people what to do or what not to do. He's actually himself embodying that philosophy up to the point of the extreme sacrifice at the end of his life. So I think that's that's what makes him special. Um, just like that's pretty much the same kind of things that makes people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi special, that they actually embodied their philosophy. They were not just preaching to other people, as opposed to, let's say, the villains of history like Mussolini or, or Stalin, who definitely did not. Uh, embody what they were preaching, right? They were just talking to people in order to manipulate them and in order to control them, but they were certainly not about to live the kind of life that they were preaching about. Massimo, the time is advancing here, uh, mm -hmm. and I promised I would keep you only for an hour. So unfortunately, I would ask sort of like the last serious question here, and then we're going to wrap it up. So some people say that many uh, singularitarians, transhumanists, uh, and other technocrats, even like Elon Musk, for example, have said that, uh, so in a way, they agree with you that virtue cannot be perhaps, uh, that, that as, as you would say, or as the Romans would say, we cannot all be Catos. Right. Uh, and therefore, consequently, we cannot expect Plato's Republic, but we have to realize that we're living in the scum of Romulus. However, right. however, they're proposing a solution for that by technology. So they say, well, if human nature doesn't allow us to live to our virtues, perhaps we should out-engineer them. So perhaps we should either use genetical manipulation or perhaps we should just create artificial intelligence and let AI uh, run the world, sort of a global AI government, if you will, which is going to remove all the selfishness, all the human flaws out of the system, if you will, according to that line of reasoning, and therefore, in a way, save us from ourselves and from right. the worst selves and solve global warming, nuclear weapons, you name it. That's kind of the solution. It's a kind of a techno-solutionism, if you will, what right. do you think of that line of reasoning? Well, um, let me make 
two or three points. So first <laughs> of all, these people have never watched a sci-fi movie, of course. You know, what could possibly go wrong if we give all the power in the world to an AI? I don't know. I mean, maybe ask Philip K. Dick uh, as, a, as, a, as a possibility. Second of all, if anybody at this point trusts the judgment of Elon Musk, I think I have a very large, <laughs> nice building, uh, you know, bridge here in Brooklyn that I can sell them for very little money. Uh, you know, you can trust me just as much as you can trust Elon Musk. Um, but the more part fundamental answer, I think, uh, to, to, to that sort of possibility is technology is exactly what got us into trouble in the first place, right? Nuclear weapons are technology. Climate change is the result of technology. It's not that these things are not happening on their own. They, it is technology. So the notion that we, that technology can solve a problem when, in fact, the problem has been brought about by technology is rather incredible if you think if you think about it now again that said i'm a scientist i do think that there are technological pro you know solutions to certain problems like for instance the covid pandemic i am happily multiply vaccinated because there is a solution to a uh, to a pandemic sometimes not all, not always but sometimes and that is a damn good vaccine and you know i'm glad that we have it i'm certainly not anti science i mean i'm talking to you to you through a very sophisticated laptop computer for instance right so i'm certainly not a luddite i i don't i'm not against technology but if technology is not used wisely that is the problem and I don't think if there is, you know, if there is somebody who comes to mind that is the opposite of wisdom, that's people like Elon Musk. Um, so I know I don't trust these people at all. Uh, they are going to do what they've done so far, which is their own profit and, and their own exploitation of the rest of us. So can we come up with technological solutions to our problems? Yes, we've done that in the past and we will continue to do that in the future. But that isn't the question. The question is, we will also keep creating problems technologically because we're not wise. We don't, have, we don't act with wisdom. And so that's why the emphasis in, in my book is not about technological solutions, which will come at some point. Um, it's about the really difficult problem, which is how to make people more conscious of the fact that they need to practice virtue. And by the way, yes, you said rightly, not everybody can be a Cato. True, just like not everybody can be a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King. But as you yourself pointed out, millions of people follow those leaders, even though they themselves were certainly not as virtuous as those leaders. But nevertheless, you know, all you need to do is to become a little bit better uh, of a human being, a little bit virtuous of a human being, and have the right idea, and then things will actually happen. So that's why technology is fine, but it is just as much a problem as it can be a solution. And what makes a difference is how we use it, what we do with it. And that's why the problem is us, not, not, an ex not external to us. Massimo, I'm very happy that we totally agree on everything because... Uh, <laughs> To finish with because my whole point of work for the last 13 years or so has been bringing ethics into the conversation of technology with the claim that or my thesis being that technology is how we do things and not why we do things and you right. can have the best how but if you mess up your why and what you're going to end up doing more damage than good and and therefore it is not the lack of technology that we have and in fact greater technology may only create the gap and the problems to grow and to get bigger yep. <laughs> rather than smaller exactly. unless we get that thing that you're talking about in your book called virtue and that other thing called wisdom and start applying our increasing power, our increasing technology in a kind of a non-self-destructive, non-suicidal uh, manner, which only comes through the proper application of wisdom and virtue, I think. So we totally agree on, on that end. Um, well, Massimo, where can people find more about you and your work? Uh, they can find me at massimopilucci.org and everything that I do, you know, essays, podcasts, videos, the whole shebang, it's there. Well, Massimo, last question I always give to my interviewees is always the same. You know, my attempt here today was 
whether successful or not, we'll let our audience decide, was to kind of blow up the rails that most of us usually get on when we're doing those interviews and kind of take us into a different realm and see what we find there, if anything. And uh, what's the best way you want to wrap this up, perhaps with a single message or any way you want to send us away with? Or did you learn anything? Did you want, to, want us to learn anything? Um, What's the best way? You always learn something if you pay attention. And therefore, my message, I guess, might be pay attention. That was one of the big messages of the Stoics. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus used the word prosoke, which sometimes is uh, translated as mindfulness. But in fact, it means attention. And uh, Seneca, another Stoic philosopher, pointed out that nothing gets improved if you don't pay attention to it. Um, so pay attention. And then all of a sudden, you, you will realize a number of things, and perhaps you will also realize which way you want to act. That's fantastic. Pay attention. Massimo Piliucci, thank you very much for being with us today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.